Batman Arkham games are considered to be some of the best, if not the best, comic book games of all time. What once started as a single standalone game has become an entire tentpole in the Batman franchise and one of the most beloved incarnations in the entire franchise. Each installment tends to draw heavily from a specific art, usually those put in the upper echelon of Batman stories or stories that are recommended to early readers. The development of this franchise goes back to 07 when Eidos Interactive, now Square Enix Europe, were given the rights to make a Batman game, but they passed the task on to a lesser known studio, Rocksteady Studios. At this point, Rocksteady only had one game under their belt. It was 2006's first person shooter, Urban Chaos Riot Response. Rocksteady would go on to work on the game under Eidos' oversight. I always felt like Arkham Asylum was as if the animated series grew up with the audience that originally watched it in the 90s. Legendary Batman writer Paul Dini was approached to write the story for the game, and for those of you unaware, Dini was a creative force for the majority of the shows in the DC animated universe in the 90s and the early 2000s. On top of that, Dini has also written plenty of comics himself, and at the time he was approached for this game, he was working on Detective Comics. The pitch Dini was given was to create a story that would be fitting for an original graphic novel or an original film of some kind. This definitely fits the story and setting of Asylum in my opinion. The overall vibe it gives off is very similar to a one-shot story you'd pick up and probably find in the late 80s or early 90s, or it could come off easily as an animated movie of some kind. The score was composed by Nick Arundel and Ron Fish. Fish is also known for composing the score for the early God of War video games and Godzilla's Save the Earth, as well as LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean. Arundel has had games like SWAT, Global Strike Team, and Battalion Wars under his belt prior to this. Like any good composition, they of course add to the atmosphere brought to the game. Overall, the composition is very moody and dark, lots of lower register tones from stringed instruments we do get accompanied by some brass at points, but overall, this could easily dub for the score of a horror film of some kind, which is very fitting. The most obvious influence on this game as a whole is Grant Morrison's Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth. The main structure of the game's plot is very similar to that of the book, and the Ghost of Amadeus Arkham entries even lift portions directly from the graphic novel. My mother lived on, but only in a dream. I returned to the family home to care for her, where she remained in her bed for as long as her body continued to breathe. Her tears kept me awake at night. I began my day returning home in good spirits, eager to see my wife and family. I ended it kneeling in their blood, broken fragments of my life, pouring through dripping red fingers. They brought the animal before me, Shameless and barking like a mad dog. For what felt like days, I endured his boasts. He took pleasure recounting his actions, cataloging his depraved crimes. What should have been revenge turned to pity. This poor dog needed my help. Similar to most comic stories that heavily feature it, Arkham Asylum itself is a character in the story. The layout of the asylum is more akin to that of a college campus in this, where in most depictions the asylum is just one large building somewhere. Doing this allows the asylum to have a wide variety of architecture scattered throughout it. I'm also a big fan of it because it shows the progression that the asylum has had expanding over the years. Similar to how if you attend a college campus, there are going to most likely be some buildings that are noticeably very old and some buildings that are relatively new, at least at the time of your arrival there. The older buildings display a very Victorian era look to it and of course gothic visuals. Most examples of this are on the eastern side of the island with buildings like the mansion and the gardens. Of course having Amadeus' grave being on the grounds really adds to the creepy old Victorian era vibe as well. Well this is a different kind of animation than, than anyone has seen before. It's a very unique look and I think the audience is going to get very excited by it. It looks great. Gotham is an East Coast city and it was built a long time ago, so there are a lot of English and European influences in its design. And that was perfectly captured. And I think that's very appropriate because Arkham is really bedlam. And it really does have the look of an old madhouse. Meanwhile, on the western portion of the island, a lot of the buildings are more modern. While still holding on to some of that Gothic vibe and atmosphere, 
They also incorporate styles such as mid-20th century brutalism and postmodern architecture. Despite the variations in architecture styles on the island, the entire facility has a very uniform feeling of oppression. The interiors feel very close and intimate with the player. Cells for the big name villains have a reasonable amount of space, but there are also plenty of cells that could easily just double for closets. The penitentiary even features a section that utilizes the panopticon effect. Heavy shadows loom everywhere, blank hallways fill buildings, and you feel very confined regardless of whether you are a prisoner or not. If you were walking down these halls, you would not feel comfortable. The patient interview tapes, of course, even add more to this feeling of closeness and paranoia. Although some people, like the Joker, obviously thrive in an environment like this. You as Batman might not even feel at ease at certain points in the game. Essentially, you're on your own playing the game the villains set up dealing with the cards they gave you in a place that physically embodies madness itself. They're on home turf. You're completely out of your element outside that one bat cave hidden underground. But of course, you, you get what I'm saying. How does it feel, Wayne, to stand on the very stones that ran with your parents' blood? Do you feel sad? Full of rage? Or does that outfit help bury your feelings, hiding your true self? Oh, you are a truly extraordinary specimen. I look forward to breaking you. Moving on to Arkham City, with a name like that, of course, this installment shows off Gotham City, or at least part of Gotham City. Arundel and Fish are composers again for the score. The score in this game is similar to the last one, but builds upon what it laid down. A more heroic vibe with more incorporation of brass. Despite choirs being in the previous installment, they make their presence more known in this one, especially by book ending the beginning and end of the main plotline, at least if you play the Catwoman DLC, it starts at the beginning. like poetry, it's sort of, they rhyme. We also carry over that animated series vibe by keeping Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill, as well as Paul Dini, writing this story once again. Tara Strong makes her debut as Harley Quinn in this one. Paul Dini also penned the five prequel comics that led up to this game. In this installment, he takes the themes Asylum was playing with and uses the new setting to amplify them. Similar to how Arkham Asylum used a serious house on serious Earth as a guide, Arkham City follows No Man's Land as a big rulebook. We have a section of the city essentially being abandoned by the government, and it becomes overrun by criminals who form turfs, led by big-name villains, like in this game's case we have Two-Face and Penguin. Among the chaos, there are people like Zaz and Hush running around taking advantage of the situation, and innocent people like political prisoners who didn't agree with Hugo Strange being thrown in here and being completely helpless. Like the last game, though, Arkham City puts a big spin on the story it draws a lot of inspiration from. Unlike the comic storyline, where Gotham City was declared a no-man's land and completely abandoned by the government, Arkham City is a sanctioned prison with the land being sold to serve as a replacement for Arkham Asylum and Blackgate. By proxy, even though it is essentially a free-for-all zone within the walls of Arkham City, Hugo Strange is actually pulling the strings on the events and treating the whole thing like an experiment, messing around with various variables. On top of that, we also have the looming presence that is Protocol 10 and Batman's blood slowly killing him throughout the events of the game. Although we do know that Hugo Strange is not in charge of the entire show at the end. City continues Asylum's themes where Batman is put up against an overall embodiment of madness, but now due to the events of the previous story, the city physically has to confront itself. One could argue that Arkham City being here is something that's being forced upon Gotham City itself. There's nothing it can do to prevent this, or there was nothing it could do to put up a fight of some kind. But you could also take the Hugo Strange and Ra's al Ghul standpoint, where Arkham City is really just revealing Gotham's true face to the world. Asriel sort of is on that same side too, but he's in a slightly different situation. As far as visuals go, this game takes place mostly in the older slums of the city. Similar to No Man's Land, there was an earthquake and a flood that impacted this area, so that's why portions of the city look in even more rough shape than they already would be considering the circumstances. For me personally, a lot of the buildings in this area are what quintessential Gotham City looks like. And despite the map being smaller than the following two games, I think Arkham City does a pretty good job at making each section 
feel pretty distinct from each other considering the turf of each villain has its own flavor and feel. And of course, there are plenty of landmarks throughout Arkham City. Arkham City also incorporates the introduction of the Burton and Schumacher random statues scattered throughout Gotham. Under Arkham City, of course, is Wonder City, which has a very nice art deco, steampunk-like vibe to it. Wonder City was created as a front, posing as a futuristic city run on Lazarus made by Ra's al Ghul that was meant to transform Gotham City at that time into a futuristic paradise. Unfortunately for that plan, the Lazarus ended up drawing its citizens into madness, which caused Wonder City to get shut down and brought to where we find it in the game. Wonder City works both as a parallel to what Gotham can strive to be, but it also works as a parallel to what Arkham City currently finds itself as. Both Arkham City and Wonder City are systems designed to eliminate corruption while simultaneously being run by that corruption they intend to eliminate. For notable locations within the walls of Arkham City, we have a mix of comic staples and new places that I feel like have become well remembered by fans. Some newer locations, of course, being the Solomon Wayne Courthouse, Cyrus Pickney's Museum, and of, of course, Wonder City, since I just spent a few minutes talking about it. Some comic staples slash movie staples, if you want to be more specific. We have the Monarch Theater, which gets that name from Batman 1989. Of course, the movie theater Bruce Wayne and his parents went to is an iconic Batman location, but the Monarch name comes from 1989. We have Gotham Cathedral, Ace Chemicals, Sionis Industries, posters for Battle Carlo, Scarfaces in a museum display, the creepy cat head thing from Batman Returns is in here. We got a lot of we got a lot of stuff. Nice of you to drop in. With Arkham Origins, we both lose Paul Dini and Rocksteady and our composers. It's a completely new slate, top to bottom. Origins is penned by Corey May and Duma Wensha. I apologize if I mispronounced that name. Both writers are best known for their work on the Assassin's Creed franchise. And the third man was Ryan Galletta, who is currently the narrative director at Ubisoft Quebec. Prior to working on Origins, the biggest game he worked on was Need for Speed Most Wanted. The themes of confinement aren't really present in Arkham Origins, which is fair because it's a prequel and the setting is obviously very different than what we saw in City. Origins unfortunately does the very stupid new 52 five years thing, but the Arkham timeline is all kinds of janky, so we're just gonna move right on past that. The composer for this game is Christopher Drake. Christopher Drake, of course, is no stranger to the DC Universe, working on animated features throughout his career up to this point, working on DC animated movies and even a couple Hellboy ones. This isn't even his only DC video game of 2013, so Christopher Drake definitely knows his way around DC compositions as far as music goes. The music in this game at points reminds me a bit of Elfman's score for the Burton movies at times, which of course makes sense since both returns and Batman Arkham Origins are set around the holiday season. Throughout the score, there are plenty of incorporations of church bells, even some sleigh bells are mixed in there. It feels very grandiose in a similar way that a lot of big Christmas carols go. As I mentioned earlier, Rocksteady did not work on this. This game was developed by WB Games Montreal as a sort of stopgap between the two Rocksteady installment of Arkham games. Prior to this, they worked on the Wii U port for Arkham City, Arkham City Armored Edition, which is where the electric shock gloves come from originally, hence why so much of that game gets carried over to this. Location-wise, Origins brings back the area that we saw in Arkham City, plus a new half of the city creatively titled New Gotham. It also goes by South Gotham, but generally New Gotham is the more common name given to it in various materials. A major difference between both sides of the city is types of buildings you see in them. The buildings you tend to see more in New Gotham would be classified as skyscrapers, lots of very tall rectangular shaped things, especially in the more swanky locations like Lacey Tower and the Royal Hotel. You'll see a very more Art Deco vibe to them, classic Batman the Animated Series-esque vibes coming from them. You'll also find more business headquarters in New Gotham, such locations like Gotham Daily, the Furniture Company, Mendo Soap, etc. Story-wise, a lot of it focuses on establishing foundations for a majority of the relationships we see between Batman and his villains, especially those of Joker and Penguin in this game. 
Because of that and how early this is in Bruce's time as being Batman, we get lots of connections to early period Batman comics as well. Plenty of notable inspirations for this game's story include Batman Year One, which is one of my favorites, The Man Who Laughs, which is also another one of my favorites, and The Killing Joke, which of course is a classic, and I'd say there's even a pinch of Long Halloween thrown in there. A thing that I really like is, aside from the main plot, which focuses, like I said, mostly on relationships and setting up stuff between Batman and his rogues, is the involvement that Gotham has as an entity in a lot of the side missions. Anarchy is one of the villains for these side missions, and he provides the majority of the insight on the state of the city's corruption and infrastructure as a whole with a lot of his anarchy tags. By scanning these, you get a little bio written up by him giving a background of how this business was and usually how it's fallen from grace if it even had grace at any point or another. Cyrus Pinckney's journal entries, meanwhile, provide insight to certain buildings and 1800s era Gotham politics involving the Cobblepots, Waynes, and even the Arkhams. Personally, I think this is pretty cool considering he gets a tiny shout out in Arkham City with the building being named after him. And I'm always a sucker for a very early era Gotham stuff being addressed like Court of Isles, um, Gates of Gotham, or even smaller stories like the issue of Legends of the Dark Knight that he comes from as a character. I think it's really cool that such a minor character in the grand scheme of the Batman mythos, as far as appearance count goes, gets to be incorporated into this big of a franchise in this many installments of it. Cyrus was an architect of many of the older buildings throughout the city, like Solomon's courthouse. Solomon even championed Pinckney's architecture. He claimed it would drive away malevolence within the human heart, which of course is very ironic. You could even make the argument that madness, corruption, and justice are part of the city's DNA considering how much the Waynes, Cobblepots, and Arkhams crossed over in the side mission story. It's also revealed that due to Cyrus's involvement, the Waynes and the Cobblepots currently find themselves in the state that they're in because of an event that took place between the three of them. Lady Shiva, despite not really having a very engaging story with her side mission, foreshadows future events and is the main tool that gets a lot of the Arkham stuff into motion in this game. Or at the end of this game, at least. This is how it happened. This is how the Batman died. Arkham Knight takes us back to Rocksteady being in control of the development. It was written by Martin Lancaster, Sefton Hill, Ian Ball, and we had some consulting by Jeff Johns. Ball and Hill were both very high up on the totem pole over at Rocksteady, so that's what they're mostly known for. Lancaster doesn't really have many credits to his name prior to Arkham Knight. He mostly worked on a handful of short films, and the only video game that he worked on prior to this was the story for Crisis. And of course, Jeff Johns is Jeff Johns. He's written plenty of comics over the years. He's best known for his run on Green Lantern. He's known for his run on The Flash. He's written Justice League, Shazam. He's written some Batman stuff, some Batman stories that even are influential enough to be source material to an extent for Matt Reeves, The Batman. Like previous games, this one too does draw some comic inspiration from a very notable story, this one being Under the Red Hood, and the DLC also sort of has some inspiration for The Killing Joke, but the DLC doesn't really have any implications on the main plot. Rock City this time presents us with a map that's even bigger than the previous two installments, but on the flip side, this game doesn't include either locations from the previous installments, so no New Gotham and no Arkham City Gotham, even though you can see that portion of the city from the top of Wayne Tower. In this game, you can tell they really went all out with plenty of in-city Easter eggs. We got references to Arnold Wesker, there's Black Canary references, there's a Paul Dini reference, there's Neil Adams, uh, Keystone City signs are around. We got some stuff promoting Metropolis as well. Um, Crazy Quilt, Bookworm, Ocean Master, uh, Lex Luthor. Green Arrow, there's a Batwoman reference on an answering machine, there, there's a boatload of stuff crammed into this as far as nods to other DC things. In Arkham Knight we're given three main islands, those being Bleak, Founders, and Miyagani. Each island sort of has its own feel as far as the look goes. Bleak Island is more similar to that of a 
traditional looking Gotham City, there are notable buildings like the GCPD and Oracle's Clock Tower. Chinatown stands out pretty well to me since a lot of major metropolitan areas tend to have a Chinatown and it's pretty cool to see one of those incorporated into the Arkham universe. Nothing really of note happens there, but it's just really cool to have in the world. Bleak also has plenty of large cartoony balloons used for a Halloween parade. This is a very notable reference. He stole my balloons! Founders Island is really split into two different sections since it is under construction at the time of the game. Part of the island is split onto an upper level and a lower level, and another part is just one ground level area. The top level is much more modern looking. There's heavy use of colored lighting on the buildings, a lot of glass pane sided buildings. It looks very downtown LA, sort of a techie area. Meanwhile, the lower levels look like your more standard traditional Gotham, but in a very bad case of disarray, it seems to have been forgotten by the city to some extent. There are portions of the island off to the side that also look like this, but it's heavily implied that they will be wiped out in favor of the big business being built. There are even some signs hanging from these buildings that show people don't want that to happen. In story and as far as in universe lore, there isn't much actually talking about this outside of visual cues, so I can't be entirely sure. Miyagani Island seems to be more of what you'd see in a more contemporary city in the U.S. It has its own Times Square area. We finally get to see Wayne Tower after being foreshadowed in a few games. And it also happens to be the tallest building on the map, which is pretty cool. Elliott Memorial Hospital makes an appearance, although it doesn't really relate to the Hush side mission, sadly, but it is involved in another one. Pigney gets another shout out with the orphanage involving Catwoman side mission. Similar to Origins though, the main plot doesn't really concern itself much with the city thematically and more focuses on personal conflicts, in this case between Bruce and the Arkham Knight, who is totally impossible to figure out. I, I would have never, I totally didn't guess that as soon as I played the game. We also have conflicts between Bruce and himself, a very man versus self type storyline, and there are conflicts between Bruce and members of the Bat family. Not physically though, of course, it's more of an emotional conflict. And unlike Origins, there isn't really a side mission that picks up the slack in regards to not focusing on the city thematically. It's just a very surface level scarecrow wants to watch the city tear itself apart through fear because it's corrupt and that's, that's the long and the short of it. There really isn't much to it, unfortunately, considering the previous two installments and how deep they kind of went into the city's history this kind of just leaves you hanging in regards to that. Arundel returns to compose Knight's soundtrack and he's accompanied this time by David Buckley. Buckley has worked on numerous movies, TV shows, and video games. There's a very good chance you've watched at least one thing that this man has composed. I don't love or really dislike this game's music. It's perfectly serviceable, but there isn't anything about it that really stands out that the other games haven't covered already. We had City building on top of what Asylum had, and we had Origins kind of throwing its own holiday flair and still feeling very Batman-y. This one, it, it feels pretty similar to City. If you've played City, you kind of can assume what this game's score sounds like. Like I said, it's not bad. I'm very indifferent towards it, unfortunately. Overall, the Arkham games stand on their own as a contained continuity, but can also provide commentary that applies to the greater Batman mythos as a whole. They can be enjoyed as action beat-em-ups with plenty of fun side stuff to do, or if you want to, you can consume them as deep thematic Batman stories that even the biggest Batman fans and the newest Batman fans can find new things to enjoy in. In the end, the Batman Arkham franchise is an ideal blend of action, atmosphere, and story for me. Nobody serenades you but me, Bat. Take it away. Up next, I guess you could say I sort of conclude this unintentional series of Batman-related architecture. We talked about most of the movies and cartoons up until 2000. 
2021 when I originally recorded that video. We've now covered the Arkham video games since you guys, there were plenty of people wanting to know what I thought about that. It's now time that we move on and talk a little bit about Matt Reeves' Batman, The Batman, starring Robert Pattinson, which I, to slight spoiler warning for what I'm going to say in the next video, I really like the movie. So look forward to that in the future. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Share this video if you feel so compelled to, whatever you, or if you don't feel like doing anything, don't do anything. Just thanks for watching. Um, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Thank you.